I love geology for the simple fact that it tells the best stories. And this story is no different. This immense bowl-shaped feature is located in the centre of a volcano in Australia known as Mount Buninyong. Upon first glance, one might understandably guess that this crater-like structure was the centre of the eruption that last occurred here. But another thing about geology that is so damn compelling to me is that things aren't always as they seem. Mount Buninyong first roared to life at some point between 100 to 150,000 years ago. Its first eruption built up a tall scoria cone, which has since been heavily eroded and reworked by the two subsequent eruptions that would follow. This first explosive eruption, and I use the term explosive very loosely here, even though these eruptions were somewhat hazardous to any life in the immediate vicinity of them, they weren't really the monstrous types of explosions that one would associate volcanoes with. These were more like a Hawaiian type of eruption. They released lava flows and did have some minor explosive elements to it, but it was largely confined in its level of destruction. The most hazardous aspect of these types of volcanic events would have been the volcanic bombs that were blown out in all directions. But again, the power that's driving these explosions is quite limited, so the large bombs wouldn't fly very far. And some of them were quite large, with them exceeding a metre in size. But in general, the size of the tephra reduced as it got further away from the volcanic centre. The interesting thing about Buninyong though, is the fact that it had this explosive element. And it's the same with what I like to call its sister volcano, Mount Warrenheap, which is located on the same fault line as Buninyong and is positioned only a short distance away from it. Warren Heap also had an explosive element to it, and a single eruption also produced a scoria cone, several hundred metres high, just like Buninyong has several times throughout history. It's very clear to me that the two share a common theme. The magma that fueled both of these volcanoes had some kind of chemistry change as it rose up and penetrated the crust, and this would make sense considering they're both seated atop an ancient 360 million year old massive magma chamber that existed in its molten state during a time when Victoria was a very different place. When major volcanic activity and earthquakes were common, and these weren't tiny volcanoes. Oh no, they were the big ones. The planet altering kind of big. And this part of Victoria's major eruptive history has a very strong link with the timing of the Devonian extinction. But I digress. The fault line that both of these volcanoes sit atop is the one that was formed from an ancient subduction event. And as a result of this tectonic activity, a huge magma chamber existed beneath this very area back then 360 million years ago. But it never erupted. Instead, it cooled and solidified to form the massive granodiorite intrusive body that exists here today. And it appears that the recent volcanic eruptions that occurred here melted some of the ancient granodiorite as it rose up through the bedrock and made its way towards the surface, which would ultimately contribute to a chemistry change that would render the magma more explosive due to a slight enrichment in the level of silica within the overall composition. If we move west away from these two scoria cones, we find typical shield volcanoes, which are formed by volcanic eruptions that contain very little to no explosivity and thus the actual structures themselves are more gently spread out. There's no major intrusive body beneath here, and the magma that rose up more or less remain the same chemical composition with only a slight variance in said chemistry from whatever sedimentary rocks the magma came across as it rose. So when the very first eruption occurred here, Mount Buninyong was both explosive and effusive in nature, with scoria being released along with lava flows. This is scoria, a dark coloured volcanic rock that's highly vesicular, meaning it has many of these cavities that were formed when the gases that were once dissolved in the magma came out of solution. And because the chemistry of the magma was more viscous, it formed a scoria cone instead of a shield volcano. So in its first iteration, post-eruption, Mount Buninyong existed as a steep scoria cone that was formed from a singular event, and this event also produced a major lava flow, known as the Clarendon Flow. This release would smother out and bury a 6 km stretch of land in a south to southeast direction beneath lava, forever altering the ancient landscape that had sat here geologically frozen so to speak, with very little occurring here for well over 300 million years. Between 50 to 100,000 years ago, a second major eruption would occur here, forming this beautiful deep bowl that we saw at the beginning of this video, which isn't an eruptive centre. 
it's actually the remains of a now dried up lava lake. When this lava lake existed here during this second eruption, it steadily filled and eventually burst its banks, with a huge molten river streaming from this point and exiting the lava lake in a western facing direction, which would flow toward and make up the present day land that part of the town of Bunanyong sits atop. And to get up to Mount Bunanyong, you have to drive up this lava flow, which gives you a really good idea of just how extreme it was, because it's pretty bloody steep. These events, along with hundreds and possibly even thousands of other eruptions, small and large, that occurred here, would produce a double whammy. On one hand, it would produce some of the most fertile soil in the state. On the other, it covered damn near every ancient river, and attempting to get to these ancient rivers would be a task that would go on to kill many miners that were brave or foolish enough to try, in order to reach the gold that was so abundantly strewn throughout the tens to hundreds of kilometers worth of ancient rivers and tributaries that once existed in abundance, but were now completely buried beneath freshly erupted basalt. A third eruption would occur here at some point in the past 12,000 years, which absolutely decimated the previous scoria cone that existed and created a new one. And that's why this volcano looks kind of weird. It once looked very much like Mount Warrenheap does in present day, with it having a beautiful, somewhat pleasing circular mound type shape to it. But it's been so torn apart from all the volcanic activity that it looks quite strange to gaze upon today. But it's fascinating nonetheless. One more very cool thing that occurred here was an eruption style known as fish events, when the earth literally opens up and lava gushes out like water would out of a broken fire hydrant. We see these eruptions occur in Hawaii and in Iceland quite frequently, and they can create a phenomenon known as a curtain of fire. I hope to one day see a curtain of fire in Victoria. I'm half kidding and half not. This state is still active, guys. But as much as I'd love to witness Mount Bunanyong's past lava flows, I can sit with some satisfaction in the knowledge that this area will probably be blasted and covered by lava at least one more time before it becomes volcanically dormant yet again like it had been for hundreds of millions of years before the most recent hotspot activity began, and like it will be again when we finally move away from its fiery reach. Thanks for watching. Deep in the heart of Queensland, Australia, a geological marvel silently narrates a tale that stretches back hundreds of thousands of years. This is the Undara Volcanic National Park, a testament to nature's raw power and timeless beauty. The park is renowned for being home to one of the world's most extended lava tube cave systems. The name Undara, an Aboriginal term, translates to a long way, a fitting description for the extensive reach of these ancient lava tubes, and we're going to discuss their fascinating formation in this video. Our journey began about 190,000 years ago during the Cenozoic Era. This was when the Earth was a theatre of geological upheaval, when a colossal volcanic eruption occurred here, spewing molten lava across the landscape. The lava flowed more than 56 miles or 90 kilometres to the north and over 99 miles or 160 kilometres to the northwest. An estimated 14.4 cubic miles or 23.3 cubic kilometres of lava flowed from the volcano at an astonishing rate of about 35,314 cubic feet or 1,000 cubic metres every second. In perspective, a lava flow of this magnitude could fill Sydney Harbour in just six days. As the lava flowed rapidly down a dry riverbed, the top layer cooled and solidified while the molten lava below continued to flow. This process created a network of tubes. Over time, parts of these tubes collapsed, forming a series of caves. Today, these caves serve as fertile pockets where rainforest plant and animal species thrive, creating a unique ecosystem within this ancient geological structure, whose inception would have began at a time when the dinosaurs were roaming this land. The Indara Volcano, the epicentre of this geological wonder, is a shield volcano in the McBride Volcanic Province. This province is a hotbed of volcanic activity, even up until recently where volcanism occurred only 3 million years ago. Unlike many vents in this region, Undara is made almost entirely of lava flows, lacking pyroclastic material. This characteristic gives Undara its unique geological identity. The park is also steeped in cultural history. And today, the Undara Volcanic National Park is a popular tourist attraction where visitors can step back in time and explore its extensive network of lava tubes, 
One day I intend to take you guys with me as I journey through them and explore them all, but I'll have to live vicariously until then. The park is a living museum, offering a window into its rich biodiversity and it's a testament to our planet's dynamic and ever-changing nature. When this volcanic eruption occurred, it drastically altered the land literally overnight. And from its violent volcanic birth to its present day tranquility, the Undara Volcanic National Park is more than just a park. It's a journey through time, revealing our planet's raw power and enduring beauty. A place where every rock and tree has a story to tell. Thanks for watching. Mount Warren Heap is one of the many prominent scoria cones that exist in Victoria. Unlike the others though, this is probably the most famous, along with its sister volcano, Mount Buninyong. It was one of the first really recognisable landmarks to grace and be embedded into the eyes and minds of Europeans, due to the valuable landmark that it served as, which let travellers know they had arrived to the incredibly rich alluvial goldfields of Ballarat which was rushed in the 1850s by many tens of thousands of people who came from all over the world to try their luck at Australia's recently discovered diggings. People from North America to Western, Southern and Eastern Europe to China and even South America came here in search of fortune. Being the recognisable landmark that it is, Warren Heap was of course cherished by the Aboriginal tribes who thrived in this land for many tens of thousands of years prior to the arrival of Europeans. In this video, we're going to take a look at Mount Warren Heap, from its formation to the large lava flows that it released, to whether or not it could erupt again. And spoiler alert, this area definitely can and most likely will erupt again soon. How soon though is the question, and what would happen when this hypothetical eruption started? I also wanted to clear up some misconceptions about Mount Warren Heap too. Contrary to popular belief, it is not responsible for burying the incredibly gold-rich Eureka Deep Lead in Ballarat. This is an old, misled belief. I can actually take you right to the tiny, highly eroded stubs of the many volcanoes that did cover this and the many other ancient rivers that once coursed through Ballarat. And I will do this and release it as a video in the very near future. But Mount Warren Heap did bury some gold-bearing rivers, just not the ones that many books attribute to it. Some of these deep leads we've found, and others we haven't. The major river it buried wasn't really ever properly intercepted, although some attempts and some minor successes were made in the early days, the basalt here is just too fresh and too thick. As a result, the actual deep lead it covered is still down there, somewhere. Filled with what would more than likely be many literal tons of water-worn alluvial gold 100 or so metres beneath the basalt. Scoria cones, also known as cinder cones or pyroclastic cones, form after violent eruptions blow lava fragments into the air, where they then quickly cool down, solidify, and fall back down to the ground as pyroclastic fragments. These fragments can range from a few millimetres to metres in size, and sometimes these eruptions blow out massive boulders the size of vans, and in many places around Victoria, you can see evidence of these eruptions and the gigantic basaltic boulders they threw all over the place, sitting piled together in many farm paddocks. When Mount Warren Heap first formed, it began erupting explosively from one central point, exploding forth pyroclastic fragments which would slowly begin to build up the conical shape. Eventually, the flanks grew too high and began to slump in upon itself, forcing a major explosion to occur. The last eruption to occur from this volcano was dated to a million years ago, and we can clearly see that it exploded out here, leaving this U-shape, where there was once a perfect O-shape, just before the climax of the most recent eruption occurred. Before this one though, another big lava flow was released from here, and it flowed south. There are a few parasitic vents around Mount Warren Heap too, but these were largely just small effusive lava flows that appear to have had little to no explosivity related to them. Now, cinder cones only erupt a few times in their life, before the jamming up of the particular area of the fault line that the magma fueling this volcano is using to ascend occurs, causing subsequent eruptions to travel elsewhere and find their own way, so to speak, which basically means finding easier routes to ascend that require very little pressure to break through. 
That reason is why we have so many of these beautiful conical structures protruding everywhere throughout the middle to western parts of Victoria, accompanied by many dozens of shield volcanoes small and large. Mount Warrenheap had a few major flows in its life, so it's changed shape and height a little. At the moment, it sits at a proud elevation of 746 metres, or just under 2,500 feet. Because of the rapid cooling that takes place during these explosive eruptions, the basaltic fragments contain many, many vesicles. Vesicles are these pitted structures found in rocks, and this picture will probably be very, very familiar to many Victorians far and wide throughout the state. This type of basalt, as you can probably tell, isn't what was quarried to make the many gorgeous bluestone structures that were erected predominantly during the first century of European colonisation here. Bluestone is a type of basalt that contained very little gases in the magmatic makeup, and thus the consistency of the actual rock itself is solid and pretty much uninterrupted. Victoria, unsurprisingly, is the only state that actually quarries basalt, and the reason for that is obvious. We're trying to get to those fucking gold rich rivers one rock at a time. Just kidding, the reason is because our state is saturated with this volcanic rock. We're the third largest volcanic province in the world, and all of this basalt was erupted recently, geologically speaking, with it starting seven or so million years ago in Victoria, and slowly moving south in its dispersal. But it's unsurprising to see these rugged volcanic structures here, because basaltic cinder cones are most associated with intraplate volcanism. And that's exactly what's happening here. With no nearby subduction zones or areas of tectonic rifting, the magmatic source for this isn't exactly clear yet. Thoughts were that this was a hotspot known as the Cosgrove Hotspot, which erupted in Australia within the past 35 million years, beginning in Queensland and slowly moving south to Victoria, beginning here around 7 million years ago. This was the most solid theory we had, until recent scans revealed it to be impossible, because the source of this magma is shallow. A volcanic hotspot has a deep magmatic origin, with the basaltic magma journeying straight from the mantle. But again, I needed to reiterate that this is not the volcano that is responsible for burying the Eureka Deep Leap. The ones that did are not very remarkable at all to look at in present day, due to the high level of erosion that has occurred. In the past few decades, hundreds of trees on Mount Warren Heap have unexpectedly and suddenly died, and we can't figure out why. Which is a little baffling and somewhat scary, but if it's a magmatic origin, I'm sure we're probably not going to know until the magma actually comes out, because let's be honest, no one takes volcanic eruptions seriously in Victoria, and we probably won't until we're forced to. So this is the story of Mount Warren Heap. If this area was to experience another eruption, it probably won't occur on the actual volcanic body itself. It'd most likely be a new location, where a new hill that could be even more spectacular than Mount Warrenheap could be built. Or not, time will tell. Thanks for watching.